Uh, well, hello everybody. Thank you for thank you for coming. Uh, we'll try not to uh, get too much feedback. Uh, my name is Mike Bursell. I am the executive director of the Confidential Computing Consortium, which is a Linux Foundation project, um, and uh, we have members from all over the place, including Fujitsu from. Uh, from here, um, and I am joined by. I think it works now. Yeah, my name is Mark. I'm a chief product officer for a Danish company called Patricia. We're working with the privacy-enhancing technologies, multi-party computation, confidential computing, overall uh, trying to combine the pieces. I've been here two years in Japan, working with some of the large corporation around Japan, helping them with some of this privacy stuff and confidential aspects. Yeah. Absolutely, and I, I have a talk tomorrow uh, when I'll be going into quite a lot of technical detail on some of the use cases around confidential computing, uh, specifically uh, confidential AI, multi-party compute, and Web3. But today is really to have a discussion about various PETs, as they're called, Privacy Enhancing Technologies. Uh, to discuss them and to uh, look at use cases and importantly to compare them and look at when you might want to use the different types. Uh, and we want you to ask questions. And in fact, the first thing it would be really interesting to know if you're happy to tell us is what sort of company you work for and why you personally are interested in privacy enhancing technologies. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, Marty, because I was speaking to him before, if you could say. Uh, yeah, I uh, work in the financial industry. Um, there are one of the reasons we're interested in privacy enhancing technologies is because uh, obviously we have some information that if that information um, were to be released beyond the sphere in which it is permitted, um, uh, that's not just awkward, that's massively damaging, possibly both reputationally financially, it could be you know, financially <coughs> catastrophic for yep. people um, and can easily be exploited. Um, and then uh, being in Japan, um, compared to some other countries, Japan has very, very strict um, privacy laws. So again, those need to be complied with um, while still knowing, knowing who your customers are without making sure nobody else can know who your customers are. Um, so. Excellent. So we have privacy concerns, we have sensitive data leakage concerns, and the financial. Uh, Santiago. I work for a Spanish technological center, it's a kind of research center in uh, telecommunications. And well, we uh, uh, mainly provide like the tech parts to, for the uh, companies around our zone that is Galicia. And we use like uh, a lot of private hand technology. We use the CEs for, the, for implementing like uh, PKIs or to implement uh, some crypto processing to some of, our, of, of the companies. And we also use one of the encryption for uh, things related to health. Great. And uh, CDC and uh, lots of things. Excellent. Very interesting. Uh, at the back, sir, if you don't mind, I can't see your, your badge. Great, thank you. Uh, Kuryangi san. Uh, yes, I work at Sony Semiconductor Solutions. Uh, we are developing AI, edge camera, and uh, definitely we'll be capturing uh, very sensitive images of people, maybe uh, uh, faces of them, uh, yeah, and that's a very private information. We will process with AI and <coughs> it's edge, uh, edge processing, so we'll be only capturing non uh, private data we want, but we want to keep the image uh, very secure in the device. So of course. I'm interested in this. Thank you. Daria. Well, I work with a uh, woman, by Toyota, in the woman's city project. So we are building a new city uh, where a lot of data will be connected, a lot of uh, data sources, and we want to provide the data to inventors in the secure and private way. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Are you uh, happy to tell us what you do? Yes, 
OK, thank you. OK, so data, data engineers, thank you. Uh, we have an interesting variety of different places and different backgrounds. Uh, so maybe we should start off by talking about what some of the key uh, technologies are. And some of you have mentioned some already. Mark, why don't you start listing some of them? And we can talk about what they, yes. how we characterize them? Yes. So maybe we should try to start lower level first. So on the okay. hardware side. Uh, why not? Going. So, so T, uh, I think there, you have a natural step in, in some of the T. Trusted execution environment. Trusted execution environment. <coughs> Um, showing of hands, we're a small group. TE, I could hear you definitely know it. I guess you from Sony would also have an idea of what it is. We all know what, what trusted execution environment is. R, everything? No, no, we don't. OK. So I'll actually give it to I, you. Yeah, on it's this. A, so it is uh, hardware-based protection of data in use. So basically, the chip itself um, will protect, um, usually with encryption, the, uh, the data and the application memory pages whilst they are actually in memory. Uh, and uh, there are chips available for AMD, from ARM, from Intel, from NVIDIA um, already, uh, possibly IBM as well, depending on how you count these things. So TE is the, the hardware version. Um, it operates at near real-time speeds. Um, and you can do just standard generalized compute with it. So that means you can combine TEs with any of the other technologies, pretty much. So that's TEs. Next. Yeah, OK. So we have some hardware now. And the interest in this privacy enhancing technology, at least for me also, is that combination of things. So if we maybe move up a layer and just talk, for instance, homomorphic encryption, or fully homomorphic encryption of that sort. right? So now we have a base, something. And we could be interested in. Have you heard about someone like Sama, for instance, confidential AI, the whole piece of we want to do large AI models, but we want to do it on banking data, for instance, right? Could be a bit afraid of that, uh, you know, I'm just going to take all my data, I'm going to decrypt all of it, and then I'm gonna just going to train, and then I suddenly have a model. What about all of these weights? What about all of this data over here? So a large part of our interest in something like fully homomorphic encryption is saying, I should be able to, for instance, train a model on the encrypted data, right? Does that make sense? Yeah? So how many are doing that today? Anyone uses fully homomorphic encryption, runs it? No. A bit? I could imagine Telecom, you want to do some of it, maybe. So what we see is a very classical example, if we take uh, uh, finance, for instance, right? You want to do fraud analytics, right? Fraud analytics mainly today is about some transactions being transferred between accounts. Normally, we talk about multiple banks if we take it kind of into a larger perspective. Let's just play with the field of I have multiple accounts in the same bank, and I'm moving a lot of money around. I'm doing multiple transactions. Here in Japan, and especially also in Europe, based on the regulation there is, any bank advisor, if, if Mike here is my, my bank advisor, right, he's actually not allowed to decrypt my information up front, ever. Right? The only thing he can see is, yes, Mark generated a transaction. Brilliant. Great. He can see it's me because he's my advisor, but he can't see what, why, how, when, anything really. Right? So it needs to stay encrypted. Go ahead. So I'm going to just. He never said what it is. There's a, a technical term for what fully homomorphic encryption is, which is magic. Yeah. Okay. It's, <laughs> it's, it's very, very clever mathematics. Yes. What it allows you to do is encrypt data and then perform certain mathematical operations on it without decrypting it and then get stuff out the other end. It's very difficult, very clever maths. Um, I, I understand about this much of, of, of this. Um, and the problem we have with it is it's very slow. Very slow. Very, yes. very slow. So sort of hundreds, thousands of times, yep. sometimes more than, than, than that. Oh, and you can only really kind of do addition and multiplication, yep. which makes writing standard computation models and doing standard computation on it rather difficult. Yep. So it's not perfect for everything. So we've dealt with, but it's based on maths. Mathematics, which we think is pretty good mm -hmm. uh, from what we know. Uh, and so uh, we've, we've now got two things. We've got 
fully homomorphic encryption. We've got partial homomorphic encryption, which, sure. which is kind of that, but not quite as strong and not quite as slow. Yeah. Uh, and we've got trusted execution environments. So let's talk about another one. What do you want to do next? Man, should we do multi-party computation? Let's do multi-party, secure multi-party computation. Secure multi-party. You can almost hear it in the word, right? Multiple parties <laughs> want to compute. So in secure multiple comp computation, it's still a lot of great math. The idea is that we generate multiple parties. We have three parties here. We have one, my as one, me as one, right? I have some data located over here somewhere. And normally what you do is you use something like semia secret sharing, right? You, you take this data, you have some kind of scheme about what it is, and I generate a lot of pieces of this data, right? A lot of, lots of lots of pieces, right? And I distribute it almost randomly out to the individual secret shared parties we have over here, right? So I contain some of these data coming into me. So I'm one party, I'm computing. I've got some. And you got some. And you also got some on it. I'm starting to compute over here, right? And then the case of multi-party computation, where it gets interesting, when I'm getting attacked by a hacker, uh, Santiago over here, right? You actually go over here, you kick me down, right? You take all the pieces, you look at them, and you stand there and say, this is, just, this is just scrap. I can't use it for anything. I have no way of reconstructing it, because I'm only seeing bytes, bits, pieces of something, right? It's still a bit slow. But the slowness is in a different place. In secure multi-party computation, because there's multiple parties, a large part of my overhead is actually migrating these parties to each other in a secure way, right? Communication. Full overhead. communication, so it's network. Because I need to see all the pieces, not at the same time, but I need to see all of the pieces of part of the computation I'm doing. And it could be a generalized computation different from fully homomorphic encryption is. So we will network, we will run around in this, and we will keep computing, computing, computing. There is overhead. And at some point, we have done a computation, and have, I will have a single result out from that. And here you can talk about, well, this is also privacy preserved. None of the parties, three banks, three healthcare providers, three departments internally, have seen the raw individual data in a full open format, right? But I will have a single result that if you're really, really good at math, you can actually prove comes from the data that you have imparted, inputted as part of the computation. So I want to give you a warning about the name here, yes. which is secure multi-party computation is sometimes used to describe exactly what has been talked about by Mark here and all the, the mathematical things. Sometimes it's used just to talk about various techniques mm -hmm. to do multi-party computation in as secure a manner as you can. Yeah. So we just need to be careful about about that and that's something to be to be a bit aware of. So I, I try to say multi-party collaboration oh, nice. uh, as a, as a yeah. way of, of getting around that. But it is you do you need to be careful and delve into what actual techniques are being uh, performed to do that. Mm -hmm. um, differential privacy, differential yeah, I'm, privacy, I'm, I'm should we do that next? Just going to say that one. Do it. <clears throat> so differential privacy and it's kind of interesting. I love differential privacy in many ways because if you're, you're a geek, it, there is there is something about that geek aspect, but it was also something about <coughs> normally you could do differential privacy on your own. That means you could layer noise into an output, for an instance, right? You can do some randomness into an output, calculate, do a bit of math. So you are not seeing necessarily. Let's, let's, give, let's give an example. Yes. Let's say uh, I've got a data for, for all of the, uh, uh, the, the Sheba uh, district mm -hmm. uh, about uh, how much people owe, uh, owe uh, their names, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, own uh, how much there is and how much they earn as well, yep. and their, their genders and their ages. Um, and I want to do some, to some work on that, but uh, I know that I can't do the pure data uh, because if I give too much, get, get it out, having done it, that can leak too much information. What differential privacy, privacy allows you to do is add noise to that data in known and calculated ways, mm -hmm. which means that the data you get out 
should still be correct yep. to within known margins of error, and the yep. known bit is important here, without allowing leakage. But one of the problems is that the more times you've processed that data, the more leakage is likely. So yes. you need to be quite careful about that. What have I missed? Anything else in the... No, I think, I think what we need to take in for differential privacy, and when we go into kind of a modern privacy aspect world, where we really look at these fully homomorphic encryption, combination of TE, multi-party computation, there's a lot of discussion of you kind of end up with a single result from one of these, secure multi-party computation, fully homomorphic encryption, and then you use differential privacy, right? We talk about this layering of privacy, because when you go into some of these considerations, you said it very well, if I take the same data, right, and I keep calculating on it again and again and again and again and again, the question is, do I learn something at some point? Just a bad person, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Potentially yeah. I do, right? Yeah. Because I, I start minimizing to yeah. a point. So I need layers of privacy to take care of it for helping. And that's something like differential privacy, which and, is a and, classical aspect. And how would we talk about the speed, the performance impact of, of using differential privacy? Yeah, but differential privacy is not that expensive. Yeah, it's pretty it, quick, it, right? It's pretty quick. Like, it, it's, ugh, everything is clever math, uh, you can say. But differential privacy is pretty quick. Right? You, you could do it on a single machine. You sit with here, all good. It'll go fairly quick, even with terabytes of data coming into the mix. It's, so Fine. does, uh, but it's lossy. Yes. It's lossy. So um, are there any other types we want to talk about? Those are the key ones. We sometimes say zero knowledge proofs are, but they are very specific use yes. cases. Shall we stick with those and maybe discuss those a little bit more? So we've got four types we've discussed, mm -hmm. right? Confidential computing, uh, trusted execution environment, same thing. Yep. Um, we've got fully or partially homomorphic encryption. Yep. We've got... Um, uh, secure multi-party computation, and we've got uh, differential privacy. So there's a number of ways we could split them. So let's let's first talk about performance. Mm -hmm. So in all of them have some performance overhead, as you'd expect. In terms of uh, confidential computing, it's kind of over here in the, on the low side, in that it should you know if you've got a really good use case, it's going to be low percentage points uh, impact. Uh, and it shouldn't be more than maybe 20% no. for a really bad case. Yeah, and it's um, hardware, right? And that's hardware, so it's generally pretty quick. Um, at the far end, we've got fully homomorphic encryption. Yeah. Okay. Uh, over here, we've got sort of uh, uh, differential privacy. Yeah. And then edging towards here, we've yes. got secure multi-party computation. So that's the first thing you need to think about. You know, what is the uh, what's the 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 performance you might have over that. Mm -hmm. The next question is is lossiness, um, and only one of them is really lossy, yep. uh, and that is uh, differential privacy. Yep. Uh, but you can calculate pretty closely what the loss is going to be there, yes. so we've got pretty good views on that. Do, do you know what we mean when we talk lossiness in this? It's, it's like when you're encoding your uh, music, yes. uh, you can lose d signaled yeah. data. Go to basically. MP3, ah, yeah, flag, flag is can, fine, but yes, yeah, exactly. So um, what other things have we got? Um, uh, we've got, can you, can you do standard um, computation with it? And yep. there's only really one where you can just write a program and it'll run as you expect, and that's confidential computing, because it's yep. just running a standard uh, executable uh, so that's good. Um, what other measures might we have? Security. Now this is a really difficult one because it can mean anything to anybody, right? There is no f perfectly secure. But I think if I'm going to give a, a figure to the, the highest general security, based, because it's just on mathematics, mm -hmm. I'm going to go with fully homomorphic encryption. That's fair enough. Um, and then probably uh, after that, um, the second one, I can't even remember it is now. Um, you uh, so no. Secure multi-party yes. computation. Yes. So that's, that's pretty cool, particularly if you have more, yep. more people. Yep. Um, then we have, because it's lossy, yeah. um, we've got 
uh, differential privacy. And then we've got confidential computing. And where you put that depends very much on your threat model. Mm -hmm. Because it's in hardware, and it's very difficult to get at. Um, but it's not mathematics, no. right? And therefore, if you could manage to get um, uh, side channel attacks, yes. if you could somehow uh, hit the attestation, we haven't talked about attestation, I'll talk about a lot about attestation tomorrow, please come along. But there are possibly some routes in. Uh, honestly, they're very, very difficult. But because it's not pure mathematics, I think we have to admit that there are situations in which we'd say mm -hmm. these, the threat model is very different and yes. that yes. security is a bit different. Um, we've talked a lot. I'd love some questions from people about any of these technologies. We can talk about them between us quite a lot. Um, or use cases. Um, lots of use cases for, for all of these. Please. Go ahead. Yeah, unstructured. So and confidential computing is perfect for unstructured data. Yes. You can use it to protect anything from a cryptographic key to uh, credit card data to um, a really good example I came across recently, <coughs> which is a, uh, one of the members of the Confidential Computing Consortium, the Linux Foundation project. They're working with the UN. And the UN um, has lots of member countries, of course. <coughs> And one of the things they need to do is come up with policies on whatever. And to get those policies, they basically need to compare all the policies from all the different countries and then kind of find maybe slightly off the lowest, lowest rung. So a kind of, let's say, an average of some type of what that policy should be on climate change or women's rights or whatever it may be, right? The problem is that those countries do not want to share that, that information with other countries, right? And it's not structured data necessarily. It needs, it'll need to be formatted. So if you can write a program that will compare them and run that in a confidential computing environment, you can prove to all of those different countries Firstly, that what's being run is what they think is run. Secondly, that when they give their data to it, it won't be exfiltrated. And thirdly, that what's come out has come out of, of that thing. And so that's kind of fairly unstructured data, an example of unstructured data. We know of people who are working to combat um, human trafficking and modern day slavery, um, again, working with different non-government organizations, police forces, none of whom can share all of that data about possible suspects or victims. But you can do the computation. As long as you can write an application to do it, you can do it. That's really difficult with something like differential uh, privacy or, or fully homeworking. It's just because, as you say, you need structured data for that. But if you can write an application to do it, you can do it in confidential computing. I know from uh direct example from your company, for instance. We, we do it on multiple party competition on healthcare, so cancer patients. Uh, and actually saying, I have multiple hospitals that needs to look at not just the strict classical uh, blood test work and everything else, but actually also doctor's notes and everything. And that becomes an unstructured, unstructured environment to work with that and actually do part of the computation. And we also have cases where it makes sense to look at a combination, saying, OK, I maybe do some of the unstructured work in my TE, my confidential computing aspect, finding some structure, generating pieces of that information, and then moving it into a multi-party setting or a fully homomorphic encryption setting coming into that. So it, it kind of depends. And maybe that's a bit of the discussion here also. Yeah. When do I choose? one over the other, right? What, why should I maybe even choose one, right? Should I have more? Um, and I, well, another thing we haven't mentioned is that these are chips, they're physical chips. Um, they're not easy to get hold of. They're easier than they used to be. You can buy them now. All of the main uh, uh, CSPs, uh, hyperscalers have them. Maybe not so much in the smaller 
CSPs, in, in, particularly in Asia, that they're taking a bit longer to come out. Um, up until recently, if you wanted to do any AI work, there weren't any GPUs that had it. The N100s from uh, our friends at NVIDIA now do have them, but the interoperation is quite complex, and those are really difficult to get hold of. Um, so those are the sorts of things you need to think about. You can, and if you're a big enough company, you may be able to do so, but those are, again, availability of the technologies. That said, finding someone who can uh, create you a fully homomorphic encryption model for your data may well cost at least as much because these are not cheap people, right? Um, so there's, there's a, a variety of, of things to be considering here. Uh, and you know, as Mark mentioned, the communication costs, if you want to be going a differential privacy uh, uh, route, may be, may be too much if you've got 15 different uh, actors, entities yes. working. You, there is a balance, and there is no correct answer, which is why we talk about there being complementary technologies. And you're deciding when in your data journey to use which of these. Um, as presumably you've been discovering as well, because you're saying you're looking at various of them. Does that answer your question? Kinda. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, are there a lot of like? Is, is there some availability of open source implementation of these technologies? Oh, yes. yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. So. Uh, the Confidential Computing Consortium has 13 different open source projects, um, ranging from really low level up to frameworks and attestation mechanisms and stuff, um, which support this. And some frameworks just to, to, to give it a go, all those sorts of things, um, from people as various as uh, a startup which I founded and which but went bust, uh, uh, through to um, Samsung, TikTok. Um, really, so I'm just going to use yeah. TikTok as an example. It's a really interesting one. People worry about TikTok because they're Japanese. They're, sorry, they're Chinese, and they uh, sorry have, we have no concerns about that. But the U.S. government has worries, and say so should they be part of this? But the TikTok is a really good example because they need to prove to their customers and to the regulators and the governments that they cannot look inside this data. So if they set this up correctly using these technologies, using in this case confidential computing, then they can give those technical assurances that they are unable to do so. So the answer is there's lots and lots in, of open source in confidential computing and... I think I will actually extend it a bit in that sense that a large part of, of the community <laughs> around this is also requiring that piece of open source to be security audited and yep. everything else. Today, if you go to Google, Apple, and Facebook, they are running a large secure multi-party computation cluster about this whole cookies environment. You know, first party cookies, how can we do it securely? We have Signal, the application, right? Also running secure multi-party computation on some of the end-to-end -end encryption coming in on fully homomorphic encryption. Google has one. Sama as a company even open sources there for full open security audit. TikTok, great example coming in. We do open source. Uh, all the researchers, main research around this field actually end up taking the protocols mostly to an open source perspective yep. because you need that security open audit of it. I'm not necessarily saying it's easy to implement, but I promise you, you can go and, and take you know, the, the full-fledged open audit and saying, if you can follow this and implement it, well, you have whatever, differential privacy, secure multiple computation, fully homomorphic encryption. And, and, and so I think there's two reasons. One is absolutely the, the community is requiring this to be open source because there are cryptographic protocols, basically, and primitives, and the community won't use them unless they're open source. Yeah. And two is that a lot of the mathematical work came out of academia and academia generally has a good record of, of yes. open, not necessarily writing very good open source, but at least yeah, of open, open source. writing open source, yeah, right? Yeah, so, uh, yeah. so apologies if there are any academics in the room. Yeah. I'm sure that you write fantastic code and maintain it very well. So we see, I think most, if I, if I take the company head on for just a second here, right? 
most of the companies that, that do work and sell software inside this field are more or less taking the, the open protocols and then giving you a way of doing it quickly so you can spin it up, like platforming it into that perspective, right? Because if one thing is implementing the protocol, but another thing is potentially running it at scale because most of these things you have heard about here have a threat model or a security model it needs to live inside of, right? Because if, if I take, I can do secure multi-party computation. If I have multiple parties and I put all the parties on the same chair, right? And I'm telling you, it's highly secure, right? But I, Mike goes in and kicks the chair, right? Oh, he has all the data suddenly. So this model doesn't make sense. If I take fully homomorphic encryption, right? And I say, brilliant, let's run it. By the way, that key, that encryption key you use, I'll lay that out in the open so everyone can take it up. Ah, okay, then I'm kind of in breach of the security model, right? If that's, that's one of the things that some um, in, in, in my area that, that, that spoke with. We have one of the problems, you mentioned the thing earlier at the start about being careful with terminology. Um, so one of the, the issues that I've mm -hmm. seen that happens a lot, um, the further you get from the cryptographers who are very yep. clear, um, is folks tend to think encryption is magic. Yes. And the requirements are, let's encrypt things. Yes. Um, and I'm <laughs> getting asked in, in work about, well, you know, I want to do this kind of encryption. And my first question is always, where are you keeping the key? Yes. yes. And that's where Brilliant. it falls down. I love it. Thank, thank you for that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love it. Um, and and some, sometimes um, they subconsciously know there's a problem. Yeah. So they'll, I don't think they're always doing it deliberately, but they'll take something which is basically a password in plain text. Yes. Um, but they'll not call it a password. No. They'll call it something else. Like, oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. Because it's not a password. It's, <laughs> it's not opening it's anything. It's an authentication magic. token. Yeah, it's, it's fine. It's, it's, mm. it's, yeah, I bet it is. Yeah. So, so this is where we've seen all, all the problems. Yeah. Um, uh, we say, yeah, well, that's fine. You're, you're implementing a really good standard algorithm, but your key is in the world. Yeah, if cryptography is nothing without key management. Yes. No. And, and that's, that's Maybe a bit of a bit of a war story here yeah. on this. When we when we go out, and I think even when you go out, right? I, I think a lot of the things that we've seen over the last three four years in this field is, first of all, you can't live in this field and do companies if you can't figure out actually solving something like that. You go, it's highly secure, right? Oh, you can't run it like this because your model sucks. Then uh, not secure anyway, right? So. A lot of discussions has come into saying, okay, you, it, uh, in, in banking, for instance, fraud analytics, amazing example, right? I have a bank here in Japan. I have a subsidiary in Europe. I am highly regulated to do fraud analytics across both, but I'm not allowed to share the data ever, right? Yeah. Ever, ever, ever. It's like no way in hell, but I want to do the computation. Brilliant. Okay. So we have ways of doing it. It could be fully homomorphic encryption, secure multiply computation, one of them, right? Fine. So let's say we, we pick one here, and there is a key structure in this. There is a key, there's kind of always a key that needs to happen. What do I do with this? Well, I actually take one of the other technologies in this privacy enhancing fields and use it for that key protection. So a great example is I do fully homomorphic encryption over here, Brilliant, you can do it. That key you have here, well, I put that into secure multi-party computation because now the key is sharded, structured. And by the way, the nodes I run, I place that on top of T at the same time. So, so now I'm at a model, right? So, so defense in depth, the layer on the onion, right? Then I'm kind of picking one part of saying, okay, you tried to breach this, yeah, that's great. Now you need to breach a quantum safe multi-party computation over here. Okay, you got through that, brilliant. Now you need to figure out going to three data centers and break in and kick the TE. I'm, you know, if you get the key at that point, I would allow you to get the data, to be honest, right? Well, well that's the other thing, you mentioned threat ball as well. The other, um, also had to ask a lot, what is your threat model? You seem to be fixing the wrong problem because you know if I were an attacker at this point, I wouldn't worry about breaching your system. I'd go around to Fred's house and I would hold the gun to Fred's wife. Yes, that's, that's, a, that's a classic XKCD <laughs> yes. about that, right? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. About the, the wrench, the five dollar yes. wrench. Yes. Yeah, and and 
Yes, all, all of those things. I mean, what, we, what this allows you to do, what all of these techniques allow you to do, and I think this is the way I, I would look at it, is that until now, data in use has typically been one of the weakest links in the yep. chain. Yep. And what this allows you to do is to make it one of the most secure links in the chain. Now, there's always going to be attack points, right? But this bit, we've, we've just raised the bar so much that this is probably not where people are going to go to attack it. Yeah. Uh, and, and that just changes your risk model. It's about changing the risk model and responding to threat models. That there is no perfect security for a system. This changes the risk model, allows you to do things you could not do before in ways that should satisfy the regulator, should satisfy your auditor, and should satisfy your CISO. I mean, I, I've spoken to lots of CISOs, and I don't think, I think maybe one of them, despite the fact that he had the title Chief Information Security Officer, one of them cared about security. They all care about risk. That's what their job really is. There should be the CRO, really, but, you know, hey. So I, I think we're, we need to kind of wrap up, and it's very nearly time for a, a drink. Um, I'd like to, to thank you very much. I'd like to invite you to uh, my talk tomorrow. Find me on LinkedIn. I'm sure Mark is also very happy to be found on LinkedIn. Uh, I have a book you can buy. I don't know if you have a book. Unfortunately not. No, I'll you can get, buy I'll my book it. then. That's fine. I'll get to Tool, it. Tool Trust in Computer Systems in the Cloud, where I talk about loads of this, uh, of this stuff. Um, and um, if you've got any questions, please get in touch. Anything you want to finish with, Mark? No, just thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. Some great questions and really appreciate it. Thank you.